This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Can Michigan basketball cut down the nets in March and win it all? We'll break it down next on Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Let's see for Anthony Clark. Wait for him, Clark. This is no time for that. In the pocket and a sack. Tim Jamison. Brady gets terrific. Frozen and a touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got it. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Kohler at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On its way. It's good. He's 5'7", 179 pounds. A junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop. And he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure coming. Sack. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. Win it. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. Go Blue, I'm Steve Dace. Welcome to this week's edition of Michigan Podcast. You know, recently we took a look at Michigan football as it related to Clemson's national championship team and did an analysis here on whether or not Michigan could follow in Clemson's footsteps and win the college football playoff. Well, this week, we want to talk about the hardwood. Michigan coming off its first loss of the season at Wisconsin, and Virginia lost the same day to Duke. So there are no undefeated teams left in all of college basketball. We're, we're past the halfway point, if you can believe that. I know, I know we're at a point now where, with football season just ending, a lot of us that are college sports fans are just kind of making the transition now full-time into basketball mode, but the season's over halfway over. Now, uh, we're, we're approaching the halfway point of uh, the Big Ten schedule as well. Selection Sunday is only about 50 some odd days away. So uh, it'll be here before we know it. The madness that begs this question. Can Michigan basketball do what last year's team almost did, what John Beeline's 2013 almost did, win the national championship, take the last step and cut down the nets? Well, to answer this question, I think we need to take a look at three facets, three criteria that we have seen play itself out in determining who does and doesn't win college basketball's national championship. Here's number one. And this is the ability to play effectively and efficiently at different paces. Because you get to run into teams that are playing differing styles come March. What we run into a lot in March Madness, especially when you look at early round upsets with big name programs, typically that'll happen on a couple of different levels. One is they're a team that likes to be athletic and get up and down the floor. They run into a team that slows everything down. I think of when Princeton upset defending national champion UCLA back in the day in the first round. They got all those uh, Bruins, uh, McDonald's, and, and prep all Americans to, to basically play a game in a phone booth, and that's just not their style of play. Or you get caught up against a team that maybe likes to go faster than you're comfortable with. You want a great example of that? How about in Michigan's history, the 1990 NCAA tournament and that buzzsaw called Loyola Marymount uh, and and their up and down style that ran us right out of the gym uh, as the defending national champion. So can you play multiple 
uh, styles and paces when you have to adjust on the fly. I think this is a box Michigan can check. They are comfortable winning a game 60 to 58, and they're comfortable winning a game 86 to 84. So I think, yes, on this first criteria, the Wolverines are are good to go here. I think they're just fine playing any particular style that you want to play, which brings us to the second one, the capability to put three scores on the floor at any given time, meaning three guys capable of generating their own offense. When tougher defenses take your primary sets and options away. If you look at what's happened in college basketball in recent years, and and this is one of the major evolutions that John Beeline made when we brought Trey Burke here. You know, Beeline and guys like Tom Izzo, they've got playbooks like football coaches, you know, it, and it's it maybe a hundred plays in there. The problem that you have with college basketball today, though, especially now that they've shortened the shot clock, is it's becoming more of an NBA game. You you might have one one rotation through a set to see if it'll work. But then after that, if you can't play a two-man game to get yourself a good shot or you know a one-four set with a point guard that can break down the other team's defense and either uh, dish or, or, or drive, um, then uh, you're going to not be very efficient offensively. I mean, you don't, you don't have 45 seconds to run a set any longer. Now you got 30 seconds. So you've got to have the ability to get guy, multiple guys on the floor that can get their own offense when the defense hunkers down. I, I saw Seth Greenberg or heard Seth Greenberg say something this week and I like Seth Greenberg at ESPN a lot I think he does great work he's likable and also insightful but I didn't agree with this analysis at all of the Michigan team he said that what blew him away about Michigan's loss to Wisconsin on Saturday is that he thought that he thought Jordan Poole was the only guy that Michigan had that could attack the rim, that could get their own offense if indeed um, that particular possession is winding down and, and the defense has it bottled up I don't think that's true at all. Uh, In fact, I think there's more uh, and more explosive dribble drivers on this Michigan basketball team than any team I can remember. I mean, I I would think in like in Michigan's, if you count uh, a Brandon Johns or an Austin Davis as kind of that eighth guy, uh, if you look at Michigan's eight man rotation, five of those guys and the only three exceptions are the bigs. Uh, and that's Davis, uh, that's uh, Brandon Johns, and of course, John Teske. Um, well, actually, you'd go, you'd, you'd go nine deep then, because then you'd also have Isaiah Livers. I'd count him in here, too. Uh, the other five guys all can attack the rim. I mean, it, it, Brzeikis, that's his game. Charles Matthews, that's his game. Or one of the two facets of his game, the fadeaway jump shot and uh, you know, and mid-range jump shot being the other. Xavier Simpson is an excellent finisher at the rim. And then the aforementioned Jordan Poole. So th- this is where Michigan really puts a strain on the defense. And I think this is an example. And Seth, if you're watching, I mean this really with all due respect. I'm a fan of your work. I think this is where maybe, and, and, and I work in national media in another capacity, and you do some local interviews and stuff, and, and you kind of have to know a little bit about everything rather than a lot about a few things. Uh, I think this is maybe where you're trying to come up with a grand pronouncement about a team that you are aware of, but you don't get to watch it as closely as people like me do. But uh, I don't think there's any great pronouncements to make after Michigan's loss to Wisconsin. I think it's as simple as you can't win them all. It's the first game Michigan's lost since last February, except for the national championship game. And it what was it, the fifth worst turnover game or something of the John Beeline era? And how often Often are Matthews and Brestikis just going to each not be able to hit water from a boat in the same game? Probably not very often. That just happens. It's it's life on the road. I don't, I don't think there's any great you know edicts or observations to make. I just think that's what happens sometimes when you play on the road in a league as rugged as the Big Ten. So this one again, check the box. Michigan can pretty much with any of its lineup combinations put at least two guys and most of the time three guys on the floor capable of getting their own their own offense at all times which brings us to the third and final criteria since ken pomeroy's rankings the ken pom rankings began in 2002 only once was the team that won the ncaa tournament not in the top 20 in both offensive and defensive efficiency right now five teams in the country meet that standard but michigan is not one of them however The Wolverines are close. They're number three in defense. They actually were in the top 20 in offensive efficiency until 
Uh, whatever that was against Wisconsin. I mean, and you could tell John Beeline was frustrated. Jordan Poole put up like five shots that would have gotten him benched most games. And Beeline just let him kept uh, hacking and jacking because it was clear that that neither Matthews or Best Ike has had it in that game. And he was hoping maybe Matthews could do a little Vinny Johnson microwave and compensate. Uh, and so that dropped Michigan out of the top 20 in offensive efficiency. So prior to the Wisconsin game, there were actually six teams in the country that were in the top 20 of both and Michigan was one of them. So while we can't check this box right now, if uh, given the body of work, the Wolverines have put together most of the season, something tells me by the time we get to selection Sunday, Michigan, unless there's an injury bug or something unforeseen, uh, Michigan will be in that criteria as well. They'll be in the top 20 in both offensive and defensive efficiency. So we go back to the question we began this week's episode with before we welcome in Michael Spath from W. WTKA in Ann Arbor. Can Michigan win it all? Can they cut down the nets in March? And the answer is yes. Thank you to all of you that are supporting us here on Patreon. We get asked frequently, hey, what can we do to support what you guys are doing here at Michigan Podcast? And one of the best ways to do that is to support us with a, a very inexpensive nominal contribution at Patreon. And as you can see throughout the course of the year for our Patreon supporters, we do give you exclusive content. We don't offer anywhere else just as a way of saying thank you. So to all of you that have supported us throughout the year at Patreon, thank you. Thank Thank you in advance to those of you who are willing to sign up and do so in the future and go blue. Back here on Michigan Podcast, joined again this week by our good friend Michael Spath from WTKA in Ann Arbor. Good to see you or hear from you, Michael. How are you, brother? Uh, I'm terrific. I wish I could see you guys right now, but uh, uh, but that wouldn't be pretty either. Right? You know, when you have when you've got hat hair day, it's not a good look on the video. So that's all right. I I see me every day, and trust me, you don't you don't really wish you could see me. You really don't. So <laughs> let, let's uh, let's get to what's going on within the maze and blue. Let's start with basketball and. Michigan suffers its first loss of the season. We had two undefeated teams left heading into last weekend's action. They both lost, although the two losses were a lot different. Uh, Michigan losing at Wisconsin, uh, Virginia losing at Duke uh, in a game where it only lost by two points against the team that was currently at the time ranked number one in the AP poll. The Wolverines, on the other hand, go to the Kohl Center, which has been a house of horrors for them for many years now. Uh, And they lose a game uh, in which they had one of the worst turnover fests in recent history in the John Beeline era. Iggy Brezdikis and Charles Matthews, just especially Brezdikis, but neither one really showed up. I knew it wasn't going to be our day when I watched Davidson take Charles Matthews off the dribble to the hole successfully, right? So you knew that you knew that probably wasn't going to be your day, and the Wolverines scored just 54 points and lose to Wisconsin, which got off to a great start, but has been struggling as of late. So I think the question a lot of people People maybe are asking, is this a one-off with something exposed? I, I kind of just think it's life on the road in a really good league. Uh, you know, this is not who this team has shown itself to be, and it's really not what John Beeline's program has demonstrated. And this is going to happen sometimes when you go on the road, like Michigan's last loss in the Big Ten. Michael, similar kind of an effort at Northwestern a year ago. But your thoughts? Yeah, no, I don't think it's a a one-off from a standpoint of Michigan won't lose another basketball game. I agree that they'll lose another game, yes. Yeah, they're going to lose a couple more. And and it's, look, they play 30, 35 games a year. And, uh, you know, you you see this in every sport. Some some days your team just doesn't play its best, uh, whether that's football and you lose. The New England Patriots going to the Super Bowl for the – Ninth time in the Brady era, and they lost what week two to the Detroit Lions. Um, and you look at you know a, a great baseball team that'll lose a game to the worst team in the league, and it just happens. And and I certainly think that there's been you know Michigan's issues um, from the very beginning of the season where weather weather was not going to be a good enough team shooting from outside. And in this game against Wisconsin, it wasn't a good team shooting from outside. It shot less than thirty percent from three point land. And Michigan's other issue was that it didn't have a lot of great mid-range jumper uh, shooters. And you can get by without, guy, without guys that shoot the two very well if they're getting the basket and they're making uh, shots around the rim. And for the most part, Michigan's been better at three-point shooting than we maybe anticipated this year, and they've been great at getting to the rim. Well, on Saturday against Wisconsin, they got to the rim a little bit, but their two, uh, you know, their two best finishers 
uh, Ignis Brzdakis and Charles Matthews were combined, uh, I believe it was two of 10 from the floor. Um, that's not going to get the job done. Uh, Jordan Poole had a bad second half. I mean, he's your one guy that is your consistent, you know, consistent shooter. Um, he didn't shoot very well. So, I mean, yeah, things like this just happen. Uh, but I don't look at this as, as something where Wisconsin revealed a huge weakness for Michigan and they're suddenly you know, going to get exposed the rest of the way. If, if there's three parts of an offensive game and Michigan on this particular day didn't do two out of the three, it couldn't shoot the three-pointer and it couldn't make baskets uh, near, the, near, you know, couldn't get in close and make those baskets, then it's going to lose on days like that. But most days you're going to be missing one part or uh, you're going to be missing one part. And if you're missing that one part, Michigan's found a way to win a lot of those games. So it's those days where they're missing two or three parts where they can't get the job done. Even then, uh, they were down 54-51 with a chance to win with about a minute to go. Uh, so, no, I don't, I'm not overly concerned about this one. I think these next three games, Minnesota, Indiana, Ohio State, will reveal plenty about how this team bounces back from adversity. One of the uh, more interesting pieces of analysis about Michigan basketball I saw recently, and I, I talked about it in, in, as part of the opening segment in the show this week, is a Seth Greenberg at ESPN is one of my favorites. Uh, I just I think he's got uh, a good combination of critical thinking, honest analysis, um, but he makes it fun at the same time. And I was listening to him do a, a radio interview this week. And he said that one of the things that really shocked him about Michigan's loss to Wisconsin is that, in his mind, it revealed they really only have one guy that can attack the basket in Jordan Poole. And who else, if if he's not doing it, who else does that? And I, I don't know. You know, I don't want to say I know more about basketball than Seth Greenberg. I think probably I've watched more Michigan basketball than him, though, and I, I, there's more guys on the floor on this team between even Simpson, but Matthews, Brezdikas. I mean, this has got as many guys who can who can attack the rim off the bounce as any Michigan team I can remember. I, am I missing something, uh, or, or is Seth Greenberg onto something? What do you think, Michael? I think Seth Greenberg's missing something. To me, that shows a guy who has not watched very much Michigan basketball because I would say there's only two guys among their, you know, their seven-man rotation that can't attack the rim, and that's John Teske and uh, Isaiah Livers. Everybody else can get to the basket. Um, I, I think that is an absurd statement. Uh, yeah, I think that's someone that has not watched very much basketball at all because um, Brosdakis spends more time at the rim than he does anywhere else on the floor. Mm-hmm. Charles Matthews, uh, you know, the game just prior to Wisconsin – um, you know, they beat Northwestern and they beat Illinois and I'm trying to think who they just played prior to uh, Wisconsin. Uh, you know, they looked, he looked terrific going to the rim. I mean, this is, this is what Charles Matthews' game is. So, no, that's, a, that's an absurd comment. I know that you asked your audience uh, today on Twitter about the next three games, uh, Minnesota, Indiana on the road Friday night, and Ohio State. Will Michigan sweep these three games? In my preseason predictions of Big Ten basketball, everything is actually, I hate to sound like Palpatine, but everything has proceeded as I have foreseen it, except for one game. Uh, I I didn't think Michigan State was going to win at Nebraska. I had them losing that game. So Michigan State right now is a game ahead of of my projected pace. I had Michigan in my predictions losing to Wisconsin as their first loss of the season. But these next three games, here's the concern I have when watching Michigan State. Everybody's just kind of forgotten Javon Langford hasn't played in like a month. And that's one of the top 20 scorers in our league. He would be the number one option on probably seven or eight teams in our league. He'd be the number two option on probably every other team in our league. Um, so not having him, and and now they've got a couple of quality road wins at Ohio State, at Nebraska. We saw the way they just uh, dissected Maryland last night. So I'm kind of I was kind of thinking, given the depth of this conference, that 15 and five might win it. I kind of think you're going to have to go 17 and three or 16 and four now because I I don't see Michigan State going eight and five in its last 13 games unless Cassius Winston gets hurt. No, honestly, after what they did to Maryland on Monday, you know, they still have to play uh, Purdue and they still have to play Iowa on the road. Um, honestly, there's, there's only the, the Iowa game on the road, I could see them losing 
and playing Purdue, um, Purdue's playing much better basketball. Uh, I could maybe see them losing that one. Other than that, the only team I think that they could lose to would be Michigan. Michigan has two more games against them. I'll say this. I don't think Michigan wins the Big Ten title this year unless it sweeps Michigan State. Michigan State is playing that good of basketball right now. I, I honestly, you, you said it, you know, they might have to go 17-3. and three. Again, I don't think they win the Big Ten title unless they go 17-3 and three and they sweep Michigan State. Um, I think Michigan State has got – uh, right now, you know, two or three losses in them. And, and Iowa on the road and Michigan on the road are the two I'm predicting. And then I think the Purdue game uh, and the Michigan game in East Lansing are the two wild cards. But those are the only four games that I could see Michigan State losing. Uh, and that's not very many. So, um, no, I think Michigan State gets to 16 wins. I think they probably get to 17 wins. And so Michigan's got a, an uphill battle. Uh, I mean, it's crazy to see that just losing one game. Um, but that's where how you know that's how good I think the Spartans are and how slim the margin is going to be for every team in the Big Ten this season. So, do you think Michigan can sweep these next three games? It sounds like you think they have to. I think they have to, and I think that they will. I think the the, the next game I predict them to lose is on the road at Iowa, um, which is in about two weeks away. Uh, that's the one that looks uh, pretty scary to me. Uh, Iowa uh, Carver Hawkeye Arena has always been a, a difficult place to play for Michigan and for most teams. Um, and that's the one that, uh, that concerns me. But honestly, I mean, when I look at Michigan's schedule, uh, I've got them, you know, winning, uh, winning 16 games. Um, as long as, as long as the, their, their struggles against Wisconsin are more a symptom of playing on the road and kind of a little bit of an, of an aberration in terms of their, their, you know, ability to get to the rim, uh, and finish at the rim. Um, I honestly think that Michigan could go 16 and four and still somehow find a way to, to fall two games back of the Spartans for the Big Ten title. Hmm. You know, when I, I've watched a lot of Michigan State the last couple of weeks, and what I have found fascinating is, you know, I don't think Cassius Winston is a, is a athletically gifted guy. I think he's savvy, a really good shooter, but I don't think he's really explosive off the bounce. They haven't had Langford, who has given them that in-between game. I mean, he has been lethal from coming off of screens like in the NBA up for with 15-foot jump shots, and he hasn't been there for a month. I mean, Nick Ward is slimmer. I don't know that he's that much better of a player than what we already saw. There's a lot of really, it's, it's a deep team with a lot of role players. What I kind of see is a team that almost feels like it's freed up from we got to get the ball to Miles Bridges. He's got to get his 20 shots. It's, it's almost freed up from, damn, how are we going to work this Jaron Jackson McDonald's All-America in so we don't get ripped, you know? I mean, it, it just seems like this is actually more, you know, Izzo chasing that elusive second title before the clock uh, strikes uh, midnight in his career. I think, and, and he's lost out on both the five-star kids he's recruiting in this 2020 cycle have gone elsewhere already. It just seems like this is addition by subtraction for them. This is more of the kind of team that he's been the most successful with in the past, which is a lot of top 50, top 100 recruits, but guys who stay around, they grow into the culture there, um, and they they just seem to be playing much more, much better together and having more fun in a way. It looks like what we've seen from John Beeline in Michigan the last couple of years. No, I agree with you. And I think, the, honestly, this team is, is probably, uh, I mean, if they don't win the Big Ten title, we'll be right there have a great chance to win the Big Ten tournament title. Uh, they'll probably go in the tournament uh, a two seed, you know, maybe high, maybe a one seed if they if they you know sweep Michigan. I, honestly, for me, when I look at this John, uh, this uh, Tom Izzo team, I think the their biggest handicap in the NCAA tournament and chances of winning it all is po- probably Tom Izzo, um, and just the fact that he's not a great uh, game to game adaptive guy in a NCAA tournament weekend. Um, but the way that Cassius Winston is playing right now, the way that they've got the support pieces uh, around him, Kyle Ahrens and, and, and certainly Nick Ward and the way that he's playing and Xavier Tillman and uh, Kenny Goins, I mean, uh, Matt McQuaid. I mean, they've got a lot of role players mm-hmm. with one superstar in Cassius Winston that is making everybody go, maybe a second superstar uh, in in Nick Ward or or in Josh Lankford if he comes back, but I I really like watching them play, um, and I really think it comes down to they're going to get to the second week of the NCAA tournament, and then they're going to play some good teams that have had a week to scout, uh, a week to scout Michigan State, and they're going to match up with some probably you know some better ball handlers, some athletic guys, 
And how does Tom Izzo and Cassius Winston adapt when they're facing off against uh, a four seed or a, or a three seed in that second weekend of the tournament? Um, that honestly is going to is going to dictate the ceiling of this Michigan State team this year. We've only really talked about Michigan and Michigan State. But it does feel like it's it, they are on a different level. Maryland's had a nice run, but I really liked Michigan State uh, in that game last night, especially when I saw the line was a nine point line for a, a game with two uh, top fifteen teams. That told me the odds makers kind of thought, uh, you know, the, the the clock was about to strike uh, midnight on Cinderella there, and they were going to get a bit of a reality check. I mean, Maryland's probably playing a year ahead of schedule right now, so it sounds like you and I agree. It's Michigan, Michigan State are in a it's a deep league this year, but those two teams are in a tier by themselves. Sounds like you agree with that. No, I definitely do. I, I, the the winner is going to come from those two. And and what I saw to Maryland uh, yesterday, and they played Michigan State, was a team that, as you said, might be a year away. I mean, they're good, but they're not ready to take that next level. You know, the two teams, Wisconsin and Purdue, that both have star power and have you know upperclassmen leading them. Uh, Wisconsin with Ethan Happ and, and Purdue with Carson Edwards. And the reason that I would favor Purdue is just because it's still a, a point guard, uh, outside shooting type of league, um, type of basketball overall. And everything goes through Carson Edwards, and he can go off. We've seen him score 40 points this year already. Uh, so he can just go off at any, at any given time. And so I, I think I, I think when it shakes out, I, Maryland might finish third in the Big Ten, uh, but I bet you the top five is some combination of Michigan, Michigan State, uh, in you know one, two, somewhere in there. Um, and then Wisconsin, uh, Maryland, and Purdue um, in some type of pecking order. And I would not be surprised to see Purdue, uh, now that they've gotten seemingly some of their issues straightened out, uh, them having to be the number three team in the Big Ten. Let me ask you a couple of football questions before we let you go for this week. Uh, a couple of developments on that front. One, the coaching staff, barring whatever they decide to do or Pep Hamilton sticks around, but we know who's going to be on the staff. It's just a matter of uh, uh, is a, does an analyst move into Pep Hamilton's position or does he get kicked out to quarterback coach and stick around? So with the with 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 the, with the departures of uh, the previous coaches that left for Ohio State and those voids are now filled, we've already talked about uh, Josh Gaddis and his addition. We'll actually ask you a follow-up question on that in a moment. But looking at this, the makeup of this staff compared to the what it was at the end of the 2018 season. Uh, do you think Michigan upgraded, downgraded, or is about where it was in terms of coaching staff uh, in the, for 2019 compared to last year? I think it probably is about the same. I think you gained an advantage on offense. I think you took a hit on defense. Uh, Anthony Campanelli um, and Sean Nua, you know what? You can talk about the recruiting aspects that they bring both as younger guys but you know replacing greg madison is as pissed off as michigan fans are about it i don't think we just sit there and go like oh well you know he's lost his touch i mean this is a guy when you look at the any position group over the last four years of the jim harbaugh era but then you want to go back uh four years prior to that of the brady hoke era if you take the last eight years that greg madison worked at michigan tell me one position group that was more consistently good than defensive line and developed talent like defensive line. Probably the only comparison might be the defensive backfield, uh, which the last couple of years has been done by Mike Zordich. And so I, I think this is a big loss. I, I think he is someone that you're going to miss. Um, I don't think you replace them with, with quite the same uh, pedigree in Sean Nua. Um, they might be excited about him, but, but that's a loss to me. I think offensively getting Josh Gaddis, if you run an offense like we are desperate as Michigan fans – to see Michigan run with the pieces that they have, then you probably this probably ends up being a plus for the Wolverines overall. But right now, when I look at it, lose a little bit, on, lose a little bit on defense, gain a little bit on offense. Uh, so I would call it a wash. Well, that's the that leads me to my final question as a follow up. Uh, Gaddis, I've listened to a couple different interviews that uh, he's done uh, in depth, including with John Jansen on his podcast. I've seen some of the stuff, some of the players, and a couple of the incoming recruits have uh, tweeted. I mean, he's not holding back. I mean, and maybe he's you know speaking through the media some to, in some respect to sort of stake out his territory here, uh, given Coach Harbaugh's reputation on that side of the ball. But people are speaking pretty plainly that this is his offense; he's in control, and that they're even going so far as to say this is going to be a new offense. How much of this are you buying into, Michael Spath? I'm trying really hard not to buy into. Trying really hard not to um, to get sucked in, Steve, as, as you're well aware. Uh, not drink the Kool-Aid until we see it happen. 
but all indications are that they are going to give autonomy to, to Josh Gaddis and that Josh Gaddis intends to run an offense like we just saw at Alabama or like we saw in the past with uh, Saquon Barkley. Uh, maybe a little bit more power than what we saw out of Penn State. But So I'm, I'm slowly starting to get excited. I tell you what, for me, the spring game and it is going to be key is, is going out there and see what Michigan has to offer. And please, for the love of God, don't fall into this, this idea, if you're Michigan football, that you've got to hold something back. All year we heard Michigan was holding something back. How did that work out for them? Uh, teams don't hold things back. Just go out there and show us what you've got. There's no reason to, to hide from it um, if, you, you know, if you've got the right pieces. So I'm starting, to, I, I'm starting to believe, Steve, but we'll see when we get to the spring. I won't, I won't listen to. I won't listen to players and coaches tell me how things are different. I won't read uh, stories from the media that tells me things are different. Honestly, is this going to be – let me see with my own two damn eyes – um, and certainly when we get to next season, let me see with my own eyes those first three or four games. Uh, but, yeah, I'm starting to believe that they might be telling the truth about this. Michael Spath from WTKA. We're off next week, Michael, so we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Brother, go blue. Go blue, guys, indeed. And hopefully we're talking about some uh, great Michigan bas- basketball success in the next couple of weeks. Indeed. Take care. That's Michael Spath from WTKA in Ann Arbor. More Michigan podcast here in a moment. If you like what we do here, WolverineDigest.com is the website. We update it frequently with commentary. If you don't want to wait until Tuesday and when a new episode gets unveiled each week, keep updated each and every week at WolverineDigest.com. Both myself and Michael Spath from WTKA and Ann Arbor write commentary there each and every day. WolverineDigest.com. This week's Twitter poll results, we asked you with Michigan basketball suffering its first loss of the season after the best start in school history. Are you still confident the Wolverines will win the Big Ten? 77% of you said yes. 23% of you said no. I am still confident that Michigan's going to have 15 or 16 wins in the league when it's all said and done, like I predicted before the year. I'm not as confident, or before Big Ten play started. I'm not as confident, though, that that will win it as I once was. It still probably will, especially 16, or at least share it. But Michigan State's already got a couple of road games uh, in venues where they could have easily lost in Columbus and also in Lincoln against Nebraska that um, are, are the kinds of games you kind of needed them to lose. So um, I'm, I'm confident Michigan will finish with every bit the gaudy record in the Big Ten that we thought when Big Ten play started. But I'm not as confident it'll be enough given what we're seeing Michigan State do right now. Of course, one way to remedy that Just simply do what we did last year, and that is beat them both times that we play, and then we guess we don't have to really worry about it too much, do we? Let's go to this week's question of the week. Bleed Blue 71 says, or asks, can Harbaugh evolve like John Beeline has? Well, let me say this. Look at the recent coaching hires for Coach Harbaugh. Uh, Ed Warner, outside of the Harbaugh sphere of influence, outside of the Harbaugh tree. Uh, Campanelli coming in from Boston College outside of the, uh, the sphere of influence, outside of the Harbaugh tree. Josh Gaddis outside of Harbaugh's sphere of influence, outside of the Harbaugh tree. Uh, Mr. Nua from Arizona, the defensive line coach, same thing. Uh, not a part of, of Harbaugh's, uh, you know, uh, previous uh, family coaching family tree, if you will. So if you look at the recent history, and even Don Brown, of course, was not, DJ Durkin was. Uh, they had coached together previously at Stanford, but uh, Don Brown and, and Jim Harbaugh had no previous connection when Harbaugh brought him in. So if you look at the recent history of what Jimmy is doing here at Michigan, uh, he's those hires are an indication he is attempting to evolve. Now, the true test is going to come on game day. And can Jimmy, as the Great Prophets 38 special once saying, hold on loosely? That will be the challenge. But we're not going to get the answer to that challenge until we get to this fall. I want to thank all of you for tuning in and watching and listening this week. I want to let you know, no episode, 
next week. I'm traveling for business. I won't be available. However, I am going to do an audio only special uh, episode next week for our Patreon supporters. So if you don't want to miss that, go to patreon.com slash Michigan podcast and be one of the people that is gracious enough to support what we're trying to do here to talk the maize and blue each and every week. And you too, then will have access to our special edition next week exclusively for our Patreon supporters. I want to thank our friends at Detroit Sports Podcast for helping to get the word out about this podcast each week. Check out our work at WolverineDigest.com. Follow us on Twitter at Michigan Podcast and leave us a like and a subscription here at YouTube and a five-star review, please, on the podcast platform of your choice. Until the next time, two weeks from now, I'm Steve Dace. Go Blue.